Hello, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And today we are going to look briefly at doc some alleged corruption charges against Dr. Nigel Clark, who is the Minister of Finance of Jamaica, the one who is heading to Washington, D.C. to be one of the deputy managing directors of the International Monetary Fund. So we are going to be looking briefly at that and to be discussing some allegations, right, against this giant of an economics and finance minister, right, because Jamaicans are so endeared to him. But before we shall delve into that sort of analysis and the allegation charges, let's look briefly at some of the comments. Well, let's look at one of the comments made by someone yesterday regarding my video that the IMF has kept us in a dead trap. Now, some Jamaicans or many of the people who responded were actually praising the IMF and the government for, you know, managing a wonderful economy and that they think unemployment rate is down and that we are doing a fantastic job. Now, that is true if the citizens were living well, right? And if we were not ranked as the second country in terms of brain drain in which the most highly trained and highly skilled workers leave for greener pastures in other, um, in other countries, countries abroad. So if we were that of a spectacular economy, if our economy was doing fantastically well, why would they be leaving for greener pastures? Why would the majority of our teachers every year, yearly, are seeking greener pastures in other countries, or nurses, or doctors, or engineers, the brightest and the most skilled are leaving yearly. Why are they leaving if the economy is that, you know, progressive, and we have this robust economy of which, you know, people have been citing evidence that these are the stats, and I've been telling them that those are stats coming from IMF and its propaganda machine. But they won't believe that because Dr. Nigel Clark, the Oxford University graduate, has said that, and the people from Washington, D.C., who are white people, they are believable. So they like to be slaves on the grand plantation called Jamaica. And I understand that. But you won't have me join your slave-like plantation, particularly the mind. Your minds are infertile, and you need to read to be, have your minds become fertile and to be receptive to knowledge, right? And sometimes the knowledge might not be convenient. It might be painful. It might be something that you can't handle, that challenges your entire being and how you think. But so often what you think and the majority of what the people think in the world are what is what is nonsense, right? It's not what I think is nonsense because you can't grapple with it because you don't read, because you're not aware of the realities, it doesn't mean, therefore, that what I'm saying is nonsense. Because what you're thinking about, and the fact that you are to take, telling about unemployment at the lowest level in Jamaica, we understand that that statistics are made up. Those statistics are made up. Those are made up statistics, make believe the statistics. And you believe them, because your minds are not fully developed, and therefore you cannot think critically. But I can't blame you because we have some of the so-called bright minds in Jamaica who also believe what they are told, right? They listen to Cliff Hughes and they listen to the radio talk show hosts in Jamaica and they believe everything that comes from these people. And these people are not there to challenge the status quo. They're there to support it, to cement the status quo so that our leaders can be comfortable so we do not have an antagonistic media because media houses should be antagonistic toward the government. They should not believe anything the government says unless there is substantive proof, concrete evidence to suggest otherwise. Right? They have the, that's what they should be doing, but they have did, you know, neglected their duties because they're paid. And they're paid millions of dollars to diffuse information that is inaccurate. But you trust them. And because you trust them, you trust them to your own detriment, right? So, well, continue to trust them. 
I, I will continue to diffuse knowledge that I think will seek to elevate you and to make you become a better thinker, right? A more, you know, productive citizen in terms of your intellectual development, because that so much is lacking in Jamaica in terms of intellectual thinking, right? And investigative journalism. And that is what we're going to be looking at this morning, uh, an article that was written by Zara Burton, who is perhaps the only investigative journalist in Jamaica, right? Um, Zara Burton is, you know, she has the, uh, what do you call it now? Uh, uh, that's uh, a, um, a, a an article. She has a website, rather, the 18th Degrees North, right? Zara Burton, um, 18 Degrees North. That is her website, right? But she also writes for the paper that I also write for. <laughs> I'm not even, okay, Substack, right? So she also writes for online edition of the Substack paper, all right? So that's important for you to go and read her article. But well, I shall be talking about it this morning. I pulled up an article just now. It doesn't seem like I'm able to read it. Yes, I'm going to be able to read it. <laughs> <laughs> After all, yeah, so we have the greener sometimes plays a lot of tricks. Sometimes you can read the article, sometimes you can't. So, you know, it's an eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and whenever you are lucky, right? And this morning I'm lucky. Now, this letter was written on Monday by a writer, a letter to the editor, right? And the title of the article is Jamaica is a paradise, but not for its citizens. Right. So that is also it nullifies what people have been saying. Some of the propagandists who are attacking me, the JLP propagandists. And by the way, I am not JLP nor PNP or PNP, I should say. I'm neither JLP nor PNP. So please do not put me into any political camps, right? Because they are the same. And that is why we, when we see what is happening with Dr. Nigel Clark, there is no objective analysis of Dr. Nigel Clark's stewardship of the economy. All we are hearing are these glowing sentiments and these glowing appraisals of Dr. Nigel Clark's stewardship of the economy since he came to office in 2018, right? In my opinion, I'm not saying he might not have done something good. I'm not sure what there is to praise about him, but collectively, when we look at the economy as a whole, we can see that the economy is not doing very well, right? We are, it's not doing very well. And you only have to look at the news in Jamaica and see when the journalists go into community and they're seeking to interview the people and the level of destitution, the level of ignorance, we look so bad. Sometimes I am embarrassed, as it were, to even open a video to, you know, in public about Jamaica, it looks very bad. Our public image does not look good for the most part. And even these communities, which are so-called middle class and upper middle class, the roads are so unkempt and they're patchy and, you know, not paved roads looking like people are civil in those communities. So when you're talking about the hills and, you know, some of these very upscale neighborhoods, the houses, the exterior, the edifice might look good, but the, the, the community itself is not well kept. We need better well-kept communities. Jamaica looks like a grand, big scale ghetto with those big houses that you have made and that you carry your friends to brag that you have all those rooms and you have this wonderful home or this wonderful house. But you first impressions are lasting. And when people arrive there, what do they see on their way to your house? What are they looking at on the outside? Are they seeing paved roads, right? With, with carefully manicured lawns and are they seeing all of that? What are they seeing when they head to your upscale neighborhood? And even our highways, sometimes the ones that have been recently built, the roads are sometimes not, they're not, there are no potholes, I should say, but the roads need to be always paved, as of, I've always suggested, because people are paying loads of money for the tolls. So Jamaicans should insist that the roads are always paved. They're not patching. They're patching up and they're, so you have some parts paved and other parts are not paved. 
That's what I see. I'm not sure if you are seeing that. Right? It's time for us now to get our acts together. But let us look at this, uh, you know, this um, article. The, the young lady says here, uh, the writer of the article to the the letter to the editor, right? Uh, DWM, I'm not sure if it's a male or a female. So uh, he or she. <laughs> As a young adult living in Jamaica, I'm often asked why so many of us dream of leaving the island which is often painted as paradise to the rest of the world. To tourists, Jamaica is sun, sand, and reggae. But for those of us trying to build a life here, it's a different story, a story that's not all steel drums and beach vibes. Well written. Imagine graduating with a degree in child and adolescent development, full of hope and eager to contribute to the future of your country. Now imagine spending the next two years selling footwear because no one will hire you in your field. That was my reality. Eventually, I found myself in the classroom, not because it was my passion, but because it was one of the few options left. And they don't have any teachers, so why not take you? But even then, I'm paid as a pre-trained graduate, pending a diploma in teaching that I can't afford to pay for, leaving me in a financial limbo. Add to that the burden of student loans, which have only grown as I struggled to keep up with payments while balancing other bills and the costs of further education. Need a passport? Prepare to lose a day, maybe two or three, dealing with red tape. So everything there is inefficient. Want to open a bank account? Block off your calendar. Every errand here seems to demand a battle with inefficiency as if time isn't money. And it's not just a hassle, it's a financial strain, especially <clears throat> when you're already drowning in debt, right? Here I am, 27 years old, married and wondering how in the world I can raise children in a place that makes even the simplest tasks feel like a, Hercul a Herculean feat. It's heartbreaking because I love this country, but loving Jamaica doesn't blind me to its flaws. The very system that should be nurturing us is pushing us away, and the government wonders why young, educated people are packing their bags. That's what she's saying. Hear how she ends her, he or she ends his or her piece. I don't want to leave, but it's hard to stay. And that's a painful truth many of us face every day. We want to build our lives here, but the deck feels stacked against us. So we daydream of migration, not because we don't love Jamaica, but because we want a chance at a future that feels impossible here. Isn't it a time we start talking about how to make Jamaica not just a paradise for tourists, but also for those of us who call it home? Well, it is a paradise for a few Jamaicans, right? A few Jamaicans are earning well, right? And they're doing well, you know, even by global standards, they're doing exceptionally well. And they're the ones who give you the impression that the majority are doing well, right? So they join their hearts and hands with the economic oligarchs, with the economic elites, and they begin to shout and to make it to the world and we're doing very well, right? And they tend to deny the reality. They, they like to live in this delusional Jamaica that they call a paradise, but it's hell for many, for the majority it is hell for a paradise for few and some of the tourists who visit the island on vacation. And you would expect that to be a, 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 a paradise for them because that's not what they live yearly also in their countries, right? Many of the tourists do not live that sort of paradise in their own countries. They're just on vacation and it's a way to, you know, live some sort of, put a move away from the reality and head into a sort of world of illusion. And nothing is wrong with that to forget your problems for a few weeks or, few, or for a few days and just to enjoy yourself, to bask in the sunshine and the, you know, the, 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 the music and the sea, right? Nothing is wrong with that. But for the majority of Jamaicans, they do not experience the paradise. Apart from the physical, the natural physical beauty, of course, evidently they can see that. But, you know, what if you're looking at a wonderful sunset and you're hungry? It means nothing to you, right? What if you are looking at a beach that you don't have access to? You have to pay to get there. It really means nothing to you. And particularly those who live in 
the beach areas of St. Elizabeth and St. Anne and perhaps Portland, and the beaches are, you know, segregated. They can't gain access to those beaches. What does it mean to them? Right? Because Jamaicans should have access to their beaches whether or not they have money. But that's the reality in Jamaica, that many of the beaches have been cordoned, cordoned off, they're cordoned off, and they're, they, they, people cannot gain access to these um, beaches, right? So that is what it is all about. But I just wanted to read that article because there are individuals who like to suggest that what I'm saying is nonsense and things are wonderful, right? And things are iry, right? Let's get together and be all right. Right, because that's all what's about is just getting together and feel all right and sing, you know, a sang can find your way back home. Right? It's all about gyrating your bodies and being stupid. Right? Because that's what Jamaica's all about. Now, let's go to the let's get to the allegations of the so-called allegations of corruption charges, alleged corruption charges against Dr. Nadal Clark. Right, and let me share my screen with you so that you cannot say that I'm making up stories here. Right, it's coming from an investigative journalist, Sarah Burton, right, who writes for Substack, an online newspaper. Right, and the title of our article is Did Jamaica's Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark use a tax exempt charity for political purposes? Can he? Right, so she's asking two important questions. Here. And by the way, this article was penned on July 28, 2024. So a month or so ago, right? And I'm not I've not heard this news story um by any of the mainstream media in Jamaica. Last month, Jamaica's finance minister, Dr. Nigel Clark, won praise for the country's removal from the international grey list of the Global Watchdog Financial Action Task Force. For the past four years, he'd been the ministerial point person on enhancing the country's counterterrorism financing and anti-money laundering regime, including getting Parliament to pass legislation to strengthen monitoring of the nation's nonprofit sector. They always have these rules for the few, and for them, it might not be so. It doesn't apply to them. It only applies to you. Just like the drug laws and the war on drugs only applies to the ordinary man. For the man at the top, it doesn't apply to them as they participate in that sort of um, business activities. But an 18 degrees north probe has found that Dr. Clark's own tax-exempt tax charity deserves scrutiny. His growth and opportunity trust limited. That's what his tax is a non-profit organization is named as, set up to serve his Northwest St. Andrew constituency by providing relief of poverty and to promote the advancement of good citizenship and community development has raised more than 91 million, that's 631 Jamaica uh, thousand US dollars in donations from unexplained sources between the inception in 2018 and 2023. It's also spent about 84 million, that's 581 US dollars million US dollars, and um over the past time period with little indication as to how that money was spent, right? So this is how these people run the country. Nothing is really transparent. They do what they want to do because they are the slave masters. They are your slave drivers and they can get away with corruption charges and nothing happens because most time the media actually conceal what they have done. Of note, that is the foundation's two most lucrative calls occurred during election years, right? So that is what she's, this is the allegation that she's presenting here. And it's a story that is very important and that needs to be investigated, right? It's a story that needs to be investigated, right? Let me share more. I think I had to click on the free, I don't think she has a free point here. Let me see if I can go back to the to the article here. Yeah. Um, yes. This was what she said was free. Um, but I might not. Yes. So let me share back my screen with you so that because I had clicked on the page version of the article and it 
gave me a partial version of, of that article, a more abbreviated version of the article, right? But this is the full length article, right? Um, uh, you're seeing, yeah, you're seeing that. So we have here, we're seeing his. So in 2018, the year Dr. Clark was first elected to parliament in a special election, the foundation took in roughly $28 million. That's 192,196 American dollars, which ran, which sank to just about 8 million. That's 56,854 US dollars in 2019. In 2020, the year of the general election, the notions shot up again, surpassing 35 million. That's 244 US thousand US dollars. They plunge again in 2021 to $1.6 million. And that's 11,060 US dollars and around 3 million. That's 21,082 US dollars in 2022. They then rose again in 2023 to over 15 million dollars. That's 106,104 US dollars. The foundation's tracking or spending tracked a similar pattern, some 15.5 million in special election year 2018, then down to just about 10.3 million, that's 71,139 US dollars the following year. In general election year 2020, expenses skyrocketed, this time to about 30.5 million Jamaican dollars, that's equivalent to 210,712 US dollars. They then plummeted again to around 5.8 million US dollars, and the list goes on, right? And she's saying identity of donors not known. Despite this heightened level of fundraising and spending around election periods, there's no evidence that funds from growth and opportunity trust were in fact used for political purposes. Engaging in politics is not on the first schedule outlining the list of charitable purposes allowed under the Charities Act, which instead includes initiatives like the relief of poverty, the advancement of education, religion, good citizenship, community development, among other causes. Right? So that's interesting. Now, listen to what she's saying here. When asked about the donors and how the money was spent, Dr. Clark responded via WhatsApp. You only have aggregate donations over the six year period, 2018 to 2023, because this information has been made available to the company's office as required, right? He always has this formal way of responding and saying absolutely nothing. He added, with respect to providing you with further information, the organization is under no obligation to you to go further than the applicable laws require. Very arrogant statement here, right? Now, it's doctor, we must understand that Zara Burton is a journalist, right? She's an investigative journalist. And journalists are the ones who should be the fourth estate, right? Who should ensure that politicians are transparent and they are held in check. But Dr. Clark is suggesting here, he intimated here very clearly, explicitly, that the organization is under no obligation to you right, to you, Zara Bird, as if she's not trying to unveil, unmask information to the public. But that is how arrogant Nigel Clark is, because you have allowed him to do whatever he wants and to run roughshod over you as, as slaves, and you love it. No longer director. Um, no. So we have Dr. Clark also pointed out that he's no longer a director of growth and opportunity to trust. And indeed, on company documents, he stopped serving as a director in February 2020. 2020. So why has this not been declared? Why is not this news in the public domain? Right? Had she not really delved into the matter, into the story, nothing would have happened. Right? Absolutely nothing would have happened. But the only remaining director is a Steph Stephanie Abrahams, who, based on a LinkedIn search, seems to work directly with the minister in his office at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service as a senior analyst. Ms. Abrahams didn't respond to a request for information, including the notes to the 
to the finan of the of the financials. So he did that person didn't respond, right? They never respond because you know when they're guilty, why respond? And if Jamaicans are not desirous of knowing what their ministers are doing, their public officials are doing, they don't have to respond. Additionally, even after Dr. Clark ceased being a director on company papers two months after or later in April 2020 on national television with Prime Minister Andrew Holness, he referred to the nonprofit as our, then my foundation, as he pledged the Jamaican equivalent of 2000 US dollars to a government sponsored COVID-19 telethon. The only gift that 18th degrees north could find as ever having been made by growth and opportunity to trust. Dr. Clark later clarified to 18 degrees north that the use of the word or was a mistake and that PM Holdes has was nothing to do or has nothing to do rather with growth and opportunity trust. Right? So it's a mistake. <laughs> Why was it a mistake? Hmm? Why was that a mistake? Clark, right? Now, she's, this, this is a video of the finance minister, Dr. Nigel Clark announced a donation from his growth and opportunity trust to the COVID-19 telethon in April, 2020 for the Jamaican equivalent of 2000 US dollars. Prime Minister Hodes, um positive Jamaica foundation donates as well. All right, so let us look at what they're saying here. I'd like to lead by example. Yes. So if we're going to ask you to give, we have a, a duty as well. Yes, yes. We don't have a lot to give. And I made sure to carry the Minister of Finance with me. So that carry. whatever we give it within our means. Endorsed, yeah. So, so I, I, I'm committing 3,000 US dollars to the cause. Yes. Minister of Finance. No. My from our right. foundation, Jamaican equivalent of two thousand. That is five thousand US dollars. Yeah, between us. That's Three thousand US. Your foundation again. That's right. That's five thousand US dollars. Yes. And mine is a positive Jamaica foundation. The positive Jamaica foundation. Yeah, I want to highlight all the positives in Jamaica. While we're talking about positive, right? yes, <laughs> I want to big up all the people who respect the curfew. Yes, and stay at home. Yes. I want to big up all the people yes. who respect the orders under the Disaster Risk Management Act, right? Yes. That if you're sick, yes. where you must leave your sick? Where must you ever sick? Yes. They if, you have, if you have flu-like symptoms, yes, flu -like symptoms, if you have a persistent cough, yes. yes. shortness of breath, stay home. No, no, sorry. Tanayaya, tanayaya. Huh? Right, so while they are making millions of dollars, right? Jamaicans must turn a day yard, right? And suffer, right? That is the whole point of the whole matter that you are slaves and you should turn your yard and suffer and die of starvation while they can afford to play around and participate in um, acts of corruption, right? Because that is how the system is designed. And I've been saying that to you for, you know, for many for a long time. I have been saying that, I have been declaring that on this channel for a long time, but you fail to understand what the situation is and the corruption that is so ubiquitous in the land of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Huh? This is who these people are, and they cannot hide their spot. Right, the leopard cannot hide its spots, and these people they're so corrupt that it's shown on their faces, it is evident on their faces, right? But they can play around with you because you believe every word they say, they are your demigods, right? And I can't change it because you're also you've already been brainwashed, and there's nothing else that can be done to um really. <laughs> you know, educate you. I don't think you can be educated. After looking at the, the, the financials, which aren't too dissimilar to from those of some of the other non-profits filed at the company's office in terms of the lack of details, Robert Stevens, 
with civil society group advocates that network still wanted more disclosure. What evidence has been presented to indicate they're dealing with community issues? What justifies them getting tax exemption? Those are the questions, and very important questions. Despite the foundation being set up to serve Dr. Clark's Northwest St. Andrew constituency, two of the three elected councillors there told 18 Degrees North that they'd never been heard of Growth and Opportunity Trust. One of the two, Andrew Harris, who's been in the role for 7.5 years, says he knew Dr. Clark had a foundation and would have used funds from it to help with projects, but he couldn't name a specific project. Right? So they are using money and they're telling you that they're going to do things and they don't do it. Right? Because you must stand at your yard. You must stand at your yard. Right? And you must observe and the, the protocols and the nonsensical things that they had, um, you know, implemented. Laws that they had made up that were not even laws. There were mandates, but they were not laws. Mr. Harris said Dr. Clark has helped him with items like cement, a bag of rice, or refreshments for past activities that would have been valued at a few thousands. However, he wasn't sure if the assistance came from the foundation or from the Constituency Development Fund, which allocates 20 million that's the equivalent of $138,246 annually to each member of parliament to be used for constituency projects. The third councillor declined to comment, right? So we don't know what's going on here. There are lots of questions to be asked and lots of responses that need to be forwarded. Now, she's asking the question, can tax-exempt foundations spend on politics? Dr. Clark isn't the only politician that has a foundation. So they all have foundations. and Well, I shouldn't say they all, but a number of them have foundations, and they walk around pretending to be important, using taxpayers' money and monies that perhaps have been borrowed. Right? And taxpayers have to pay back that debt to build themselves up. And then they tell you how wonderful the economy is doing. Of course it's doing wonderful. Of course the economy is doing fantastically well. Has never been doing better because they can dance and they can, you know, travel on their private jets and first class. While you, the citizens, are struggling to buy food and to shelter yourselves and your children. Right? But you're happy. Because it is Jamaica to the, ro the world. And if you can have your athletes go and they run and yay, Jamaica to the world. And when the tourists get there, they see how impoverished and how destitute you are. And they go abroad and they make films and videos of you and put it on YouTube. And say, Jamaica, <laughs> a very poor country. Right? Without any laws and people are stupid. This is the sort of image that we have created of ourselves and we have sold to the world. Right? And we continue to lie to ourselves. That Jamaica is paradise. But paradise for who? For the oligarchs and for the few who are lucky. Let's say lucky because some of you should not even... It's, it's luck. It's not that you're brilliant. It's not that you have any special talent. It's just that you were in the right place at the right time. And you were positioned into, you were placed into a position and, you know, thank God you can live well. But many of you do not have the competency to be in that position, if truth be told. So don't go and lie and say they're doing well because you are doing well. You are facing your experience uh, you know, of, on the experiences of other people, of the masses of people. Because we cannot say that Jamaica is a middle-class country. It is not. It is a country that is starkly divided between the wealthy, rich, and the poor. 
and the few middle class who are down there are just trying to survive. Hmm? There is a report, you know, I, you, I'm going to leave the article. You can decide to um, read it. I will read and leave, we'll leave it in the description at the end of the video. And um, let, us, let us look at something, though, from this article, because it's important that we read this part of it, right? You can read the full article for yourselves. But the writer of the piece, Sarah Burt, says here, the Tax Administration of Jamaica, that's the Tax Administration Office of Jamaica, TAJ, wrote to 18th Degree North that where political activities form the core of an organization's charita charitable purposes, its commissioner general, by virtue of his power vested under Section 16 of the Charities Act 2013, would object to the registration of such an entity on the grounds that those activities, being political, would not fall within the ambit of the provisions of the first schedule of the Charities Act 2013 as being a purpose which the common law regards as charitable. However, it didn't respond when asked whether a back to school treat for, for, for residents of a politician, polit politician's constituency right before an election, for example, would be deemed to be political, which it of course it is. The TAJ did make clear that both the political party and the political candidate are required to pay taxes on any income deemed exigible, meaning taxable, unless the donations received are publicly or purely gifts rather from the donor with no material benefit in return since gifts aren't considered income. The TAJ says material benefit is not defined in the Income Tax Act through the ordinary definition refers to a benefit, direct or indirect, which may not be financial, but has a monetary value and is considered more than um, the minis, minimis, which is, I guess, the minimum, right? It's Latin word for the minimum, the minimis. In the United States, and she's saying here, she continues, Former President Donald Trump was fined two million U.S. dollars in 2019 after admitting to misusing charitable funds. A New York state judge ruled that the tax-exempt st status of the Donald J. Trump Foundation was used to further the former president's political efforts. The charity was ordered to be shut down. It's always very interesting how Jamaicans tend to any acts of corruption. They always say Donald Trump and it's Trump and they any what should I say now? Any sort of totalitarian, you know, characteristics or you know personality traits, you know, politicians, we always liken that politician to Donald Trump. As if our politicians are not in many cases worse than Donald Trump. Right? And even some of the politicians, Jamaican politicians who are pointing at Trump are guilty of the same charges. But because we do not have a functional judiciary, then they get away with them. They get away with these crimes. And the, the, the investigative journalism, what the journalists should be doing, they're not unmasking, they're not unveiling, as it were, the political corruption charges. As a result of that, they get away. And then they behave as if they're innocent lads, right? And lasses walking around, pretending as if they're important, dressed in nice suits, right? And then you believe them. Because that is how superficial your minds are. Now, let us see what she continues to say here, because this is very, very important. She says here, by examining the foundation's tax filings with the Internal Revenue Service, a document that is public in the US, the Washington Post reporter who broke the story was able to find out that the foundation had admitted to the illegal act of self-dealing. Self-dealing is when funds from a nonprofit are used 
to enrich its leaders and their businesses or families. Like in the U.S., Jamaican tax-exempt charities are also required to file a tax return. But unlike in the U.S., those returns aren't made public according to the TAJ. Right? So this is how this is how we are. This is how we are as a people. That lots of things that we have there, lots of the rules that should be enforced and the laws that should be respected and obeyed are not. And our politicians get away with them. Huh? Our politicians get away with them. And then the economy tankers. Because guess what? It's just corruption, corruption, corruption. Everyday corruption is the watchword of the Jamaican political landscape, right? Look at this, what I just put up an article here, and it is coming from the Legatum website on prosperity, right? The Legatum, let me see if I can share my screen here so that you can see from whence this article is coming. So we have here the Legatum Prosperity and Jamaica is being ranked, right? Prosperity Index 2023, and we are ranked 57 out of 167 countries. We're ranked 57th, right? So this is the country, right? The, what you call the land of prosperity and the land of Usain Bolt. It's ranked 57th of the 167 countries. And it says Jamaica is, is 57th in the overall prosperity index rankings, right? Since 2011, Jamaica has moved up the ranking stable by three places. So we were, you know, 60. We were six, I would think we were 60th. We would have been ranked 60th in among the 167 countries in 2011. So we have just moved three places up, right? So Dr. Clark has done a miracle. <laughs> of moving us and Dr. Clark and Dr. Peter Phillips and the Aldi Shaws, right? Have done a fantastic job. This is now more, more than a decade. This is more than a decade and we have just moved up three places, right? This is what we are happy about. And this is what we say to the Jamaica to the world one of the poorest countries in the world, and yet still we are proud that we're making wonderful progress in terms of aiming for prosperity. And we have a low unemployment rate in that country. Jamaica performs most strongly in personal freedom, which is true, and enterprise conditions, but is weakest in safety and security. The biggest improvement compared to a decade ago came in economic equality, right? So we are ranked 57th, right? 